Hi guys, welcome to our, our new FD92 online course. Uh, we're going to begin with sort of an overview of an industry procedure from uh, design ideas uh, all the way through production and development uh, right up until uh, we see our garments in retail stores. This is meant as a brief overview um, of sort of the design process and the production. Uh, as we're going to be focusing our course content on uh, industry standard procedures that designers have to go through um, in their design creation and also in production, it's good to know sort of how it all fits in together. And when we um, sort of pick out certain aspects of this process, um, we'll know where they fit in on the overarching spectrum. Um, we're going to start really at the beginning, really before um, uh, we're going to get into any of the details, but all companies need a start, so design companies are no different. And at the beginning of every company's start, all companies need what's called capital. Capital is money uh, that investors give or a designer or a company owner uh, can acquire that is used in the startup of their company. Now specifically, if you're starting a company and you need capital, that capital is called uh, venture capital. Um, and again, it's used to buy equipment, hire employees, um, uh, used for advertising, all the things that a company will need to build itself up um, from the ground up. So again, we have our uh, uh, capital, and again, that can be acquired in many different ways. Um, uh, potential business owners can get investors on board, uh, they can go to a bank and get a business loan, uh, they can get quite lucky and either have money on their, uh, on their own or inherit some money, which is, you know, particularly lucky case. But in any one of those instances, it is necessary when starting a business, uh, fashion design businesses included. Now, once the business has started, we see uh, fashion design companies really in all shapes and sizes, depending on how long they've been, what kind of uh, clientele they cater to. Um, and we really see from small to large, and again, in many, many different iterations. So we're going to look at sort of just some general um, fashion companies uh, from small to large, starting with the small design studio. Now this studio might uh, only have one small studio that um, only a few people, um, potentially even one person is working out of. Uh, they have a lar smaller, sorry, smaller customer base, um, will tend to work more locally, um, so have production and sales um, uh, geographically more locally oriented to their design studio or exist online uh, and not have any uh, physical retail uh, uh, footprint at all. Uh, this would be what a small design studio might look like. Um, again, many iterations of them. Uh, you can also notice uh, the smaller design studios, they have things like home machines and not industrial machines. Um, they're focusing more on sort of, you know, um, uh, design sketching instead of production uh, sketching, uh, things like that. And of course, these smaller companies are prone to the quirks of their individual designers and owners so very greatly. As we move to a sort of mid-size uh, company structure, this is sort of a basic outline of what it might look like. Um, so we'll have different departments that all work together um, to run the company. They're overseen uh, by a president. And then up here we have a, a chairperson, but that very may, may likely be uh, a board of uh, board members that run the company. Um, or stockholders, main stockholders. Oops, sorry about that. Didn't mean to do that. Um, and then underneath, uh, we have sales and marketing. Uh, we would have the design uh, department headed by a design director or head designer, uh, which is typically the department that we would be looking to work in. We would have a production facility uh, as well uh, with a main manager. Um, a lot of times these managers are given the titles of vice president as well. So, um, you know, whoever is heading that main uh, branch, um, uh, we very much uh, might be looking to work in the production department, depending on uh, whether you like the design side or the production side, pattern making and specking and things like that a little bit better. 
Um, we might have a plant manager um, who manages the facilities or production facilities if they are within um, our company's uh, um, uh, sort of oversight. However, most fashion companies will use third-party uh, manufacturing. Uh, then we'll have a controller, accountant, HR, and things like that. We'll move on to large uh, scale fashion conglomerates. Um, and this is a chart of LVMH, which is the largest uh, fashion conglomerate in existence today. They focus on luxury goods. And as we see, um, here are all their different brands. So all these many, many different brands um, are really owned all by the same company. Um, uh, and although they run fairly independently, uh, they are still uh, subject to oversight by the main board members, presidents, uh, CEOs, and chair people uh, associated with, uh, with LVMH. Um, the reason that LVMH has been able to grow so big, especially for the luxury goods, is the luxury good model has a uh, business model has been fairly precarious over the past few decades uh, and so they can exist in uh, easier in a state of uh, more assured consistency uh, by being bought up by a large uh, conglomerate on their own they may hit a few seasons and run into some financial troubles however together we can uh, or they can uh, funnel you know funds from an uh, over um, performing brand into a less performing brand, uh, keeping together the strength of the whole conglomeration uh, as a whole. Now, once we have a company, we're ready to start designing for our collection, uh, which is where design development, trend forecasting uh, come in. So there's many trend forecasting service. These are a couple, um, uh, as well as you may have heard fashion snoops, which you should actually have access uh, to through your in, uh, Inside Kingsborough account. So check it out. It should be a tab once you log in to your homepage there. Um, um, we'll look at it a little bit more uh, in depth in our own trend forecasting um, uh, section. Uh, but again, they are services. They either pu uh, publish uh, publish magazines or have websites that include many different uh, forecasting services and this will include you know color forecasting what color palettes uh, are going to be popular for different markets and different customer bases uh, what trends are being seen on the streets on the runways things like that um, uh, what's popular in, in culture media art and things like that all different things that uh, designers may use uh, um, when they're developing their new collections. Of course, we all want to uh, be up to date. And uh, these people uh, spend a lot of time and a lot of effort being able to uh, clearly communicate uh, what they see as uh, trends coming up for new seasons, new markets, and things like that. A lot of times their publications and subscriptions to the websites can be quite expensive as well um, as testament to, you know, um, how sought after their services really are for designers. Um, in addition to trend forecasting, we may do our own groundwork. Um, uh, so we may send designers or design assistants out onto the street to see what people are wearing. Um, and of course, they'll go to specific locations uh, where uh, a company's customer may be um, thought to hang out. So specific bars, specific stores, specific streets, specific um, any sort of place that your customer or the company's customer uh, would be thought to frequent. Uh, then notes will be taken on pretty much just visual observation on what people are wearing, uh, how they're wearing it, um, uh, different trends and colors, styles, and things like that. Movies, music, sports, and other culture will play an influence into trends and fashion direction as well. So popular movies, um, uh, celebrity culture, what uh, different celebrities are wearing, um, uh, what different sports um, icons are wearing. Things like all of these things will play a factor in what a company may try to utilize in their design uh, forecasting and in their thoughts when designing their new collections. 
Once we sort of have a route to go on with our design development, we have to established a color palette, um, a design direction, probably a mood, um, and we have a good idea of what kind of fabrics we're going to need for our uh, collection. So once we have that, we need to start sourcing our textiles. Now this is an image of TextWorld at the Jacobs Javits Center, which is a large um, New York-based textile uh, trade show uh, where many, many companies and designers uh, come to connect with different textile mills and uh, retail and wholesale textile providers uh, to be able to source fabrics for their new collections. Now when we say source, basically secure a manufacturer and mill uh, that will be able to um, uh, provide fabrics to the designers for the price and quantity and color and styles that they need. Many, many of these textile uh, trade shows happen around the world, um, and it's always fun to go to them as well just to see what's going on. Now, once we have secured our um, textile uh, source, we need to start working with the mills in order to make sure that the textiles received in, uh, to produce our collection will be correct. Now, these are a couple ways that we are able to do this. Um, for solid color fabrics, we'll typically go through a process of lab dip approval for a garment order. And on the uh, left hand side you can see examples of lab dips. Now lab dips, uh, what will happen is a tiny small sample of the fabric intended for use will be dyed in a variety of different ways. The different samples will be sent to the designer to review and a dye lot will be chosen that most accurately matches the standard colors chosen for the um, collection. Now this is important because every fiber, whether it be wool or cotton or synthetic, will take dye a little bit different. So every fabric might need a different sort of cocktail of dye uh, to match the same color. We cannot just use the same dye lot um, uh, formula for every fabric that we have. It will need to be altered. And these dye lots um, and lab dips are uh, viewed by color specialists that view them under full, free, uh, full spectrum lamps that really highlight the color differ differences very, very well. It's meant to mimic a really bright, sunny day. So if you've ever noticed on, under the sun, a really bright, sunny day, that colors seem a little bit more vibrant and rich, it's because it's, we're getting a fuller spectrum of light. Um, so we'll use that uh, in order to match our colors uh, the best. Now, if no colors match, we'll send them back and try again and until we can see, uh, uh, obtain a dye lot that matches our needs. Now with printed fabrics, we'll use something called a strike off um, and we'll do different sort of tests with the prints um, that uh, work in the very same way as your lab dips. Um, sort of different attempts to match our print on the actual fabric will be made. They'll be sent to the designer to approve or make corrections. Um, until a final uh, print will be accepted for uh, further uh, production. Now once we have our sample fabric, we'll typically, uh, once our color and dye lots and strike offs and everything are approved, we'll order what's called a, a sample uh, um, lot of fabric. So a smaller amount of fabric will be sent to the designers to create what's called sample garments. Now these are garments that will represent what will comprise of the, uh, the collection uh, that will be presented to the public and to retailers and buyers uh, all over. Um, sample producers, again, will make uh, sample garments based on the uh, designer's uh, uh, designs. Now with a small company, we may just make one sample garment, but for larger or medium-sized companies, uh, many to very, quite a few sample garments will be made. Now these sample garments will have a variety of uses coming up. The first and foremost is to create a cost sheet. 
So once a sample garment can be made, that means a pattern has been finalized. And once a pattern has been finalized, we can um, decide how much a garment will cost. Now, of course, uh, this will mean that since we have a pattern, we know exactly how much fabric and how much material will go into creating each garment. We also know uh, what the labor costs will be to produce each garment. So given that, we will create a cost sheet that will um, first uh, lay out the costs to the company uh, that will incur when actually making the garment and then that will be used um, in order to uh, determine a wholesale cost and a retail cost. Now the amount that it will be marked up varies from company to company um, uh, based on their business models. In addition, sample garments will be used to create line sheets now, line sheets are um, uh, shown here for various different garments, and some are uh, using simply flat sketches. Uh, in this case, they may have decided to uh, skimp on time and use sample garments uh, later on just for determination. They wanted to get their um, line sheets out to customers and buyers a little bit sooner, so they foregoed uh, or forewent the um, step of making sample garments for in, to include in line sheets. They will still make sample garments, but just in order to save time in getting the line sheets out, they used um, uh, Illustrator probably, um, or any sort of other um, program to create sort of flat-like uh, renditions of the garment offerings for the season. Um, in addition, uh, other companies will, of course, photograph their line sheets either on, on forums, mannequins, or models and send those out or post them online for retailers and buyers to peruse at their leisure. Now, um, this is, again, not meant for retail sales. This is meant to communicate the design company's uh, new collection offering directly to retailers and buyers at a wholesale cost. In addition, trade shows like the two shown above are very popular ways for designers to connect with potential buyers. Um, the one seen here, Moda, which is a popular one in New York, as well as the Coterie, uh, and other ones across the world uh, occur and look very much like the top two images where every designer will have a little booth um, packed full of their sample garments where retail buyers will walk around and peruse uh, the offerings to see what might work in their shop. Uh, and it's meant, again, to make connections between designers and uh, retail uh, um, uh, buyers. Now, trunk shows will also uh, provide this very uh, uh, similar um, function. However, they tend to be a bit smaller, whereas you can see in the Moda, they have many, 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 many different designers. Trunk shows are typically smaller, featuring only one or a, a small grouping of uh, like designers in a much more intimate setting that kind of reflects a little bit half trade show, half fashion show. The other use for sample garments is for sample sales. Now, larger companies will hold what are called sample sales, and they are some of the best kept secrets in the industry. If you've never been to a sample sale, I would uh, advise you look on the websites uh, of your favorite retailers, favorite designers, and uh, look very carefully for any information for upcoming sample sales. Uh, I doubt many will happen this spring, but moving forward when all the chaos is over, uh, definitely look for it. They do not really widely advertise sample sales. Uh, companies really try to only target their very core customers uh, to attend sample sales. They're very small. They don't really want them bum rushed by a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, the general public who would not really fall into their core customer um, uh, model. Um, and what they do is they will put their samples uh, for the next collection up on sale at very reduced prices. Um, this is really just to encourage sales. Um, why? Well, what they're going to do is, you know, all, all of these clothes are very, very um, uh, reduced in cost and people are going to uh, be very encouraged to buy. 
From this sample sale, they're going to look at the number of garments that are sold. So if we look at, you know, the upper left-hand picture, we have all these different color op options. We can see some colors are already selling out very quickly, have a fewer number. Some colors will not be sold as much. Now this will uh, help guide the designers in production. The garments and colorways that pretty much fly off the shelves will be made in higher quantities than the ones that are not. Garments that really don't sell well, colorways that really don't sell well during the sample sale may be dropped from bulk to get production altogether. Trade publications such as magazines or online blogs and things like that are also different alternative ways for uh, companies to get in touch with buyers and communicate across the industry on different things that their company will be doing. Now sample garments are also used in fashion shows. Uh, however, um, the um, purpose for fashion shows have changed quite a bit throughout the years. They used to be one of the main um, ways that designers connected with their buyers. And instead of, you know, celebrities and, you know, fashion journalists, that's really who would attend um, fashion shows. However, that has really moved away from its original purpose. And now fashion shows are really just attended by, you know, fashion journalists, bloggers, celebrities, and things like that, and are not used as a way to communicate um, latest collection offering to retail buyers. They're really more used as media events um, in which the brands can get advertising. They serve to strengthen brand recognition and glamorize company identity, not really as a way of communicating with buyers. Now, the sample garments will also be used in advertising for the brand, for their upcoming collection. And of course, there's many different ways that fashion companies can advertise. Uh, they can have magazine ads, uh, very popular, you know, um, ads in Vogue or uh, Vanity Fair or different fashion magazines like that uh, are uh, almost, you know, the majority populated with um, a very beautiful, um, artistically shot uh, fashion advertisements for luxury brands. Um, brands at other price points might um, advertise on TV or over the internet, um, so on and so forth. That is not the only way that we can advertise as well. Uh, many times brands will partner with celebrities um, in uh, movies or uh, sports or music uh, and try to get their looks on those celebrities. Um, also, uh, in the modern day, we have uh, the rise of influencers. Uh, many designers will choose to work with popular influencers in the hope that it will um, promote their brand, promote the popularity, and over uh, the long term, promote the sales of their upcoming collections. So now that we have our sample garments, we've had everything else, we have uh, contact with um, buyers, orders from buyers are probably coming in, uh, retail sectors have been determined and what stores should carry what numbers if we have our own retail um, outlets, uh, bulk production is ready to begin. So we know exactly how many garments of what size, of what color are going to be made. Um, again, bulk production refers to when the large quantities of the collection garments are being produced for the retail market. Now, um, this is a very simplified work order, but uh, much more complex ones, as you can imagine, will be sent out. But what we'll do um, once we have determined our uh, bulk numbers is fill out a form uh, and send it out to our factories. Of course, too, this will also include a bulk order from our mill. Uh, that has to go out first, um, of course, because all of our fabric has to be produced uh, and then shipped to our garment factory to be cut and sewn to produce our final uh, garments. But of course, what we order from the mills will, of course, also be determined by how many clothing, uh, how many items of clothing we'll be, we will be making for our bulk production. So we put in our bulk order to the mills first, have the, uh, that bulk shipment be sent to our garment factories for again, the garment bulk production. 
In addition, um, some smaller companies who are going to make smaller runs for their uh, uh, collections may utilize what's called cutting tickets. Um, cutting tickets uh, show uh, shown here um, illustrate what they're used for. So a cutting ticket will be made for every individual garment made uh, or style of garment, I should say. It shows all the colorways that it will be made in and also all the sizes to be made. This is supposed to be used to directly communicate with the cutters, so the people that would be cutting our fabric uh, for our collection. And again, it shows what sizes need to be made out of what colorways. And every um, uh, cutting ticket will be made for a garment style. So on the left, we see we have a nice little dress. It will be made in three colorways, a black colorway, a red colorway, and a polka dot colorway, and be made in several different sizes, a zero, a two, a four, a six, an eight, and a 10. Um, again, this is meant to be sent directly to the cutter to use to know what uh, they should be cutting and in what quantities. Larger scale companies will make use of what's called a marker. Uh, these are examples of markers. Now what the markers do is they are basically computer programs in which all of the pattern pieces for all of the sizes of a single fabric will be fed in. And this might include even different garments um, if they're using the same fabric. Now once all of those um, pieces have been fed in and the information of how many they need um, by garment and by size, what will happen is the uh, computer will run what's called an algorithmic nesting program uh, uh, that will strategically place each piece as close together as possible. And this will reduce the fabric waste. Now, this is huge, especially for bulk productions, very large bulk productions. Um, it's basically like a puzzle where we fit in our pattern pieces the most efficiently, uh, in the most efficient way possible. Now, it might not seem like, you know, we could save, let's say like an eighth of a yard, but if you're making 10,000 garments, an eighth of a yard uh, could, uh, uh, on this layout, could save you hundreds if not thousands of yards um, uh, in your bulk fabric purchase. It, uh, you know, resulting in thousands uh, of dollars saved to your company, which again would go directly into profit because if you minimize the cost of each garment being made, you're helping to maximize your profit of each garment. So this is what a marker will look like, and it's typically again used to mid to large size companies. Now once our uh, uh, fabric has been cut, we need to have it sewn. And this is uh, governed by spec sheets and tech packets. They are the communication between designers and production facilities. Again, most fashion companies do not have in-house production, or even if they do, they are in a different branch or sector of the company than the designers will be working. So uh, very clear, and uh, almost overly descriptive um, uh, methods of communication between designers and the pr uh, uh, production facilities needs to be implemented. And they're implemented again in the way of spec sheets and tech packets. They are, detail every single measurement within a garment down to the smallest detail. Um, overall measurements will be taken and then additional close up um, Charts and measurements will be taken for every uh, small detail of the garment. So, for instance, look at this jacket. We have an overall measurement chart uh, on in the middle here that goes over overall measurements for the garment, but very likely we'll have several other pages detailing small details. So the button placement, how far is it from the edge, how far is the spacing between the buttons? How far is the space from the sweep or bottom of the jacket to the for, uh, second bottom button? How far is the, um, uh, from the point in the neckline, the break in the neckline where the lapel uh, begins? How far is that first button down from that? How wide is the cuff? Um, uh, all different things like this uh, need to be implemented. And really, 
Uh, in the industry, there is no detail too small to be recorded on these uh, uh, spec sheets. It's very important that everything get recorded to ensure uh, what gets produced is exactly the way the de designer intends it to. Once our spec sheets are out, it's time for our garment workers to make our garments. So the fabric is cut and then sewn together by garment workers, uh, uh, much like the one shown above. Uh, most garment factories, again, are not uh, part of the design companies that utilize them. Um, uh, in fact, most of them are located overseas and act as third-party entities, um, which again means that they are not owned or operated by the design companies themselves. However, um, most fashion companies uh, will have very good relations and long-standing um, uh, partnerships uh, with garment facilities. Um, however, there are exceptions. There are garment uh, design companies that will operate their own production facilities, um, uh, even some that do it within the states, although they are very few and far between these days. Once our garment factories are finished with the bulk production, we'll go ahead and ship it on out all over the world, uh, or just to one location, depending on the size and distribution of the fashion company. And of course, here we are at our last stop, at our retail outlets, whether they be physical retail outlets or online uh, stores. Uh, our bulk production is ready for uh, availability to the retail market. Uh, and end consumers. And that concludes our whole process of start to finish uh, design processes. Throughout the course, we'll go ahead and we'll take a much more in-depth look at all each one of these steps to make sure that we know everything related to it and are prepared for industry terminology and, uh, uh, and also to make sure that we'll, we are very familiar with this industry process. Uh, stay tuned and again, uh, as always, um, stay healthy, stay safe, uh, email me at any time uh, if you have any questions and, uh, you know, this is going to be a pretty hectic semester, not going to lie, um, so we're all going to do our best. So signing out, until next time, this is Kate and I'll see ya.